Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh Day Adventist Church. Wherever you may be watching, thank you for joining us today and happy Sabbath. And to each one of you who are joining us in the sanctuary, thank you for being here and for singing with us. Our first song this morning is a request sent in by David, David Wigway from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the hymn is 489, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, verses 1 and 2. presenting that song to us this morning. Um, lovely one that we need to remember that Jesus is a constant lover of our soul. Let's sing uh, hymn number 12, but before we go to 12, um, keep those song requests rolling in here at, right here at Sacramento Central uh, Church by going to our website, um, saccentral.org, click on the contact us link, tell us who you are, where you're from, and the title of your hymn. And we'd love to sing it with you on an upcoming Sabbath. Let's go to hymn number 12 now. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. We'll be singing verses 1 and 3. Let's bow our heads for prayer. 
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for another Sabbath day. We thank you for waking us up this morning. Um, the fact that we can breathe is a miracle from you. We thank you that we can come together in fellowship together and study your word. And we ask your blessing upon Sabbath school this morning as the past, Pastor Chris brings to us um, the study in Revelation. I pray that you will help us to be receptive and give us understanding and bless those who hear. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Our Sabbath school lesson will be presented by Pastor Chris Buttery, Senior Pastor here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, those that are, are tuning in, uh, whether you're watching live stream, whether you are uh, watching on our website or our YouTube channel or on 3ABN Proclaim or First Light Broadcast down in the South Pacific. We're so glad that you are uh, able to join us uh, with, uh, with every program. We have a free offer, of course. Uh, this offer today is C21912, C21912. And to receive that, all you need to do is call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. We'll be happy to get that free offer out to you. It's this presentation on CD or DVD, and uh, we want you to have it to review, and then, of course, uh, feel free to share it with others. And uh, so give us your full address, and uh, that would be really helpful. Thank you very much. We're uh, going to go right into our study together this morning. We're in lesson number 12. We're at the uh, end, and, you know, 13, 13 weeks just aren't enough uh, to really cover the book of Revelation. We have to just kind of skip over a few things and cover uh, what one determines to be the most important thing. Um, but anyway, uh, we're here, and next week we'll be uh, concluding our study in Revelation. It's been a good journey, hasn't it? It's been a good to review these uh, important truths, look at um, some, uh, some deeper issues as we've studied together. Uh, today's lesson is Judgment of Babylon. And uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Revelation 17. We're going to be looking at, primarily at Revelation 17 and a little bit of 18 this morning. Uh, the scripture reading is actually from Revelation 18, verse 4 and 5. And I'll read that for us here. And it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Do you remember who her is? In the context of, this, of these verses, it is Babylon that, uh, that uh, the angel is referring to. And why should people come out of Babylon? Lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Now, some of you may uh, be familiar with, uh, he was primarily early 20th century to mid 20th century actor. His name was W.C. Fields. And W.C. Fields, he was known to dislike several things. One was children, sadly. Uh, another one was dogs. And then another thing he disliked was religion. Very unfortunate. Upon his death, a portion of his estate was to establish, quote, the W.C. Fields College for Orphan Boys and Girls, where no religion of any sort was to be preached. That's what he said in, uh, in his estate. Just before his death, interestingly, um, uh, Fields, a friend of Fields, visited him in the hospital, and he found Fields thumbing through a Bible. And this was very intriguing to uh, his friend. And he asked Fields why he was thumbing through a Bible of all books. And Fields was said to have replied, I'm looking for loopholes. I'm looking for loopholes. You know, it's hard to escape the notion that one day we will have to face the judge of all the earth to give an account for our lives. The writer of Hebrews states it succinctly in Hebrews 9 verse 27, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And like W.C. Fields, there are a lot of people today who are hoping for some leniency in the judgment, looking for some loophole because they know that they're not going to fare well when they face the judge of all the earth. Now, we learn in last week's lesson as we studied Revelation 15 and 16 together that one day God is going to draw a line in the sand. He, one day he's going to say, it is done. Uh, the declaration will be made that you read about in Revelation 22, 11, which says, uh, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, 
Let him be holy still. That's a declaration that will be made. Probation's door, much like that ark door, door to the Noah's ark was shut, door of probation for humanity will close. Every case will have been decided and Jesus will come. But before Jesus comes, you remember uh, seven angels coming out of the temple of God, they have something in their hand and they're going to pour them out upon the earth. They, are the, they have bowls or vials in their hand and they're going to pour out the seven last plagues. That's right, the seven last plagues uh, upon the earth, specifically upon the beast power upon Babylon, which we just read in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people, lest you receive of her plagues. So the plagues are being poured out upon this great apostate system. And uh, especially, and also those who've worshipped the beast, who've uh, worshipped the image to the beast, and also have received the mark of the beast. In that day, there's only going to be two groups of people. There's only going to be two groups of people, and they're going to be divided, not by ethnicity, not by culture and not by creed, but by the decisions they have made for or against Jesus Christ. That's how it's all going to be playing out. That's how it's all going to take place. One side, on, those, on one side you have those who are marked, who follow the whims and wishes of the enemy of souls, who has desired worship from time immemorial, who wants it for himself. Then on the other side, you have those who are sealed or marked, and they've been faithful and loyal and have sided themselves with Jesus Christ, the creator of all that there is. Now, if we think about the plagues, remember there, the sixth plague. The sixth plague caused uh, something to be dried up. Do you remember what it was? We read, read that in Revelation 16. Symbolically, uh, it, it referred to the river Euphrates, um, which, is, which really refers to the deceived people of the world who withdraw their popular support from that great city, that end time Babylon. And this, uh, this withdrawal of support is preceded by this extensive demoniac activity that counterfeits the miracle working power of God through his people in the last days. Um, you read that in Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14, the spirits of demons going out to deceive the world. And the de this demonic activity is sent out to lead people and get them prepared, not prepared, but lead them to the battle. You remember of what, which, which battle? Armageddon. That's right, that last great battle, a battle for allegiance between Christ and Antichrist. The seal of God, is it, are you going to receive the seal of God or are you going to receive the mark of the beast? These are the actual issues that are at play, um, which culminates ultimately in the deliverance of God's people by the rider on the white horse who is none other than Jesus Christ himself coming to rescue his people. So if, if we think about this battle, on the, out, on the outset of this battle, final battle, there's a great earthquake that occurs, and that's under the seventh plague. There's this great earthquake, earthquake that occurs, and this earthquake breaks up that unity of Babylon, and it says that it breaks it up into how many parts? Three uh, different parts. Um, Babylon comprises three entities, essentially three components. First, you have the dragon, uh, which represents spiritualistic activity. Uh, you remember the dragon is also known as the serpent. The serpent deceived uh, our first parents with the lie that you will not surely die. And so this spiritualistic, spiritualistic activity is rampant. So you have that under the imagery of the dragon, the devil, of course, seeking to deceive people. You also have the beast power of Revelation 13, the lamp, the, the, uh, yeah, the leopard-like beast of Revelation 13, which is, we understand to be the papacy. And then you have the false prophet. The false prophet's a little bit trickier to figure out, but I'm going to give you a couple of verses that you can compare together. They're Revelation 16, verse 13. Revelation 16, 13, which talks about this false prophet. Uh, also, Revelation 19, verse 20, it refers to the false prophet again, and it actually gives a definition of who the false prophet is. It's the same power that causes all the world to be deceived and receive the mark of the beast. And that power is the one you read about in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16. So that's your third verse, Revelation 13, verse 16, which is the, uh, the lamb-like beast that um, creates an image to the beast and forces, coerces, deceives people to receive the mark of the beast. So essentially, the false prophet or the, that particular beast power is apostate Protestantism, 
When we go over to Revelation chapter 18, 17 and 18, we're talking, going to be talking about the mother, mother of prostitutes and she has daughters who followed her teachings and her practices. So Babylon that was unified through spiritualism, through apostate Protestantism and through uh, the papacy are going to, it's just the unity is going to break apart under that great earthquake. But let's look at Revelation 16 verse 19. It says um, that, uh, now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And we learned that the wrath of God is poured out in the seven last plagues. That's right. <clears throat> so let's keep this in mind that that verse announces the collapse of end time Babylon. Chapter 17 and, verse, and chapter 18 will deal with how this collapse will eventually take place. So it talks about the, the collapse of Babylon in Revelation 16 verse 19. Revelation 17 and 18 tells us how this collapse will actually happen. Okay, so we're going to go to Revelation chapter 17 verses 1, 2, and 5. Thanks, Jan. And the word says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have ma been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Okay, so we're introduced here to uh, this woman. Now, before we talk about the woman, I just want to step back a brief moment and kind of give us a, big, a bigger picture of what we're, what we're looking at. Revelation chapter 17 has primarily two parts to it. Verses 3 to 6 of Revelation 17 uh, is the symbolic vision that, uh, that John sees. This is what you see in these first several verses in Revelation 17. That's the first part. And then what he was told, this is the second part, he, what he was told as an explanation of that vision. That's verses 8 through 18. So you've got the first part, the symbolic vision, uh, verses 3 to 6, and then 8 to 18 is the explanation of that vision, although some of, those, some of the explanations still carry some symbolism, uh, which is very interesting. So part one, part one reveals the crimes of Babylon. And that's why you have uh, heaven's indictment or a declaration uh, of why the divine sentence is being pronounced on Babylon. And so that's part one. Part two reveals the sentence itself and how it's being carried out, how it's going to occur. So Babylon uh, has a, a criminal career and it reaches its climax, as we talked earlier, under the sixth plague, which you read about in Revelation 16, 12 through 16 whereas the sentence is executed under the seventh plague, all right? So part one is concerned with the events under the sixth plague, the build up and leading to the sixth plague, and then part two with those under the seventh plague. Does that make sense? That's what we're reading here in Revelation 17. So we, we could say that really Revelation 17 is a delineation of the final crisis when Satan puts forth his uh, supreme effort essentially to annihilate God's people who are standing true and faithful to him, uh, have the faith of Jesus, they keep his commandments, and all the powers of earth are arrayed against them because they believe that they are, are, they are the cause for all these calamities taking place in the earth. But the good news is that, that at the time of this final blow and final movement to, to strike God's people, God strikes to intervene. And uh, he protects his people and Jesus uh, then comes. And so we have wonderful hope. Um, so that's Revelation 17, those two parts. Sixth plague, seventh plague, uh, the indictment and then the actual uh, uh, punishment. And uh, so let's take a look now. Uh, Rev Revelation 17, uh, Jan just read it for us. The woman's name is Mystery Who? Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots or the mother of prostitute, prostitutes. Now, we need to pay very close attention to this because God's everlasting gospel message that goes to the entire world that you read about in Revelation chapter 14 tells us, tells us that the second message, the second angel's message reminds us that Babylon has what? 
fallen. That's right. So this is a message that's going to go to everyone on planet Earth. Everyone's going to hear it. Everyone's going to understand this message, but not everyone is going to accept it because there's going to have to be a decision that has to be made. Let me explain that. Earlier in Revelation, you have another woman. So there's really two women in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 12, you see this other woman. And this woman, as we discovered, represents God's true church, represents his faithful bride. And often throughout the Bible, God refers to his people as his, as his bride. Sometimes God refers to himself as the husband of his people. It's, it's very endearing, these terms. The bride of Christ. Paul also refers to uh, the church as <clears throat> as the bride of Christ. So here in Revelation 12, you have God's faithful, his true people. But then in Revelation 17, you've got a different type of woman, don't you? And she's a, she's a prostitute, it says. This is, uh, this is a false religious system that has corrupted herself. She's gone after other lovers and has been unfaithful to her sacred trust. She's not followed God's word. So ultimately, you have these two, you have these two groups. You've got God's remnant, his faithful people, and then you've got Babylon. And the people on planet Earth will have to decide whether they're going to be a part of God's faithful people or they're going to be a part of the Babylon system. Are they going to receive the mark of the beast or are they going to receive the seal of God? I'm trying to bring all these kind of concepts together in a last day picture for us. This is what this, this struggle is all about. So in Revelation 17, uh, we, the woman is known as a, as a harlot. She has daughters uh, who, uh, who follow her. And uh, what, is it, what is she sitting on here? What does it say she's sitting on? She's sitting on... What is she sitting on? <laughs> she's sitting on water, right? She's sitting on waters. That's what it says. And what, a water, what does the water represent? If you go to... That's right. If you go to verse 15, we'll read it, uh, we'll read it there. It says, uh, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So when you're thinking about spiritual Babylon, you also need to be thinking about ancient Babylon. How ancient Babylon fell is how spiritual Babylon will fall. Ancient Babylon was local and literal events that took place back in a locale with literal city of Babylon. And then when you get to Revelation, you're dealing with a worldwide universal spiritual Babylon. And uh, how was ancient Babylon supported? She was supported, she was actually sitting on the river Euphrates. This was her main, this was her means of support. To have a city with a flow of water running through it was a tremendous accomplishment and uh, provided tremendous security for fear of um, armies surrounding uh, the city and trying to cut off the supply of the city. Um, you can read that in, in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 13. Uh, Babylon sat on that great city. End time Babylon, like ancient Babylon, will rely not on literal water, but will rely on the masses of the people who support her. That's where she gets her strength, through her converts, through her, the support mechanism that supports her. Now, uh, Revelation 17 also talks about two groups of people that are involved in this illicit relationship with uh, Mother Babylon, and they're being seduced by her. So let's read verse 2 again. It says, now this mother, this, this harlot, she, was, uh, she sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and who else? The inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So first you have one group, uh, they're in this illicit relationship with her, the kings of the earth or the governing political powers of the earth. They're in this illicit relationship with her. Um, it's, it's kind of like an adulterous, spiritually adulterous relationship between these kings and between the harlot. And it symbolizes uh, this illicit union between the two. What do you think this union between the two are? between the political powers of the earth and between this uh, apostate church. The union of church and state. That's right. It's the union of church and state. And then the second group that's in an illicit relationship is the inhabitants of the earth. Not the, govern, not the governing powers, but the governed masses. So you have the governed masses. 
and uh, they are being, uh, they are, they're, they're drawn into and seduced by this power. It says that they are made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, if you go uh, to Revela- uh, Isaiah chapter 28, we won't do that right now, but Isaiah 28, um, it, you can read pretty much the whole chapter there, but you'll, you'll see references there to, to the milk of God's word and how God teaches his, word, teaches his people through the milk of his word. But prior to that, you have this idea of people being uh, erring in judgment, um, uh, being uh, intoxicated with wine. And the context speaks to teachings and doctrines. So what are the inhabitants of the world being seduced by, uh, by, with, uh, by the mother? It is her what? doctrines. It's her teachings. That's exactly right. Everyone except the last day remnant will follow Babylon, will be deceived by Babylon. All right. So here's a question for us. What should this tell us? What should this tell us about following popular sentiment, especially when it's very popular? Yeah, you have to be very careful, don't you? Yeah. You've got to be incredibly careful. Just because the masses and the multitude are doing something doesn't make it right. Now, it doesn't mean just because the multitude is doing it that it is wrong. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But in the last day context, the masses are got Jesus said, broad is the way, and many there be that go down that way to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. When it comes to truth, when it comes to genuine Christianity, History has shown that the minority are the ones who follow Jesus faithfully and the majority do not. And so in the last days, we have to be incredibly careful uh, not to succumb to peer pressure. You know, the, the news today, you know, it, it's something else. It, it generates a lot of angst and division in America um, by highlighting particular stories of this political party and that political party and people are taking sides and there's arguments and uh, it's been going on for a while, but it's pretty intense, and it's been intense for a while here recently. Um, we we ought not need, need, we ought not follow a political party. We ought not get caught up with the hype and hysteria of the media. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus, our nose in His Word, and follow Him faithfully. And let's, by God's grace, be courageous to stand on His truth now, so that when things really get difficult, we're able to stand on His Word then. Let's go to Monday's lesson, and uh, we'll talk about the, the harlot, uh, the prostitute, because the scene switches from her riding, uh, her sitting on waters to her riding on a scarlet beast. It's interesting. Um, Lotus, would you read that for us? Revelation 17 and verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Okay, thank you. So John was invited in, in vision to come, you read, read this in verse 1, to come and see the judgment of this prostitute, this woman. And she's sitting upon many waters. When he carries, and when he's, then he's, when he's carried away into the, the wilderness, he sees a woman, but instead of her sitting on uh, the waters, she's sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. So he was told what he was going to see, but when he sees it, he sees her actually sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. And this beast has how many heads? Seven heads and how many horns? Ten horns, right, okay. So now we know what water represents in Bible prophecy, right? Uh, What does a beast represent? A nation, that's right, a kingdom, a political entity, right? That's what it, it means. And so, and you can read Revelation, uh, sorry, Daniel chapter 7, verse 17 and 23, uh, where uh, Daniel sees these four beasts coming up out of the sea and they're political uh, 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 nation entities. Um, and so the woman is riding the beast. And it's interesting that you've got the woman, the church, and you've got the beast, the state, they're separate, but she's riding the beast. Now, if you were riding a horse, who's in control, the horse or the rider? Well, depends, I guess, who's riding the horse. (laughs) Depends if you know how to ride the horse or not, right? Um, But the one who's on top should be the one who's generally in control. Um, You'd you'd like to think so. You wouldn't want that horse to just take off. So when you see the woman sitting on top of the state, it denotes uh, dominance. It denotes control over the, the state. So here we have a false religious system and she's dominating secular and political powers. That's what we're seeing here in Revelation chapter 17. Now, we've seen this before. 
Interestingly, we've seen this before. When you go back to Revelation chapter 13, John sees this beast, this leopard-like beast in Revelation 13 coming up out of the sea. And that leopard-like beast, as we've studied before and as we've learned, depicts the Middle Ages church. During the Dark Ages, during the Middle Ages, it depicts that church, that church-state union during the Middle Ages, which of course brought about a great degree of spiritual darkness. Um, if uh, you were living back then and you disagreed with her, you'd be persecuted, there'd be fines, imprisonment, ultimately death. And then uh, it was also a period where the church trampled on the truth of the, of the gospel and on the truth of God's law and truth was hid. And uh, only prelates and those who, who, learned, who knew Latin could understand or at least read the Bible. And they were the ones then interpreting it to the people, the ignorant masses. So the truth was being trampled on. And this power dominated the landscape for prophet, prophetically. We read this in Daniel 7 uh, under the little horn. Again, in Revelation 12, where the woman flees into the wilderness, where she's protected from this persecuting power for 1,260 prophetic days or years. And so this, this power dominates the landscape for 1,260 years. And then at the end of the 1,260 years, in 1798, uh, the, one of the heads of this beast is wounded. But the Bible says that that wound would one day be healed. And then what would happen? All the world would do what? Wonder after the beast. So what we saw in uh, ancient times in the Middle Ages will be repeated in the last days when church and state unite, you see. Now, let's go to verses 4 and we'll read uh, verse 4 and 6. So the woman, she was arrayed in purple and scarlet and she was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations of the filthiness of her fornication. And verse 5 talks about her name written on her forehead. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. I marveled with great amazement. So here, the picture of the woman, she's portrayed as extrav extravagantly arrayed in purple and in scarlet. She's adorned with ornaments of gold and precious stones and pearls. Um, interestingly, if you look at Jeremiah 4 verse 30, and you can reference that, um, it was, this is the type of adornment, this was the type of a practice of ancient prostitutes, and they would wear this to enhance the power of seduction. And so what you're seeing here, she's of course the mother of harlots, she's practicing, she's alluring, she's being seductive. And what's interesting here is that her dress, it counterfeits the attire, the clothing of the high priest in the Old Testament. Very interesting. That attire, and you can read this in Exodus 28 verses 5 and 6, the attire of the high priest was purple, scarlet, and also gold. But what's interesting, and this is an interesting point, whereas, uh, whereas Babylon has the same colors, she doesn't have one color that the high priest has. That's the color blue. That's the color blue. Blue, uh, that blue, and you know the, the, the priest would have this around the, the hem of their garment, and I think uh, others too. But anyway, blue represented obedience. And here, Mother Harlot doesn't have blue as a part of her, her wardrobe at all. And then she has uh, on, written on her forehead this blasphemous inscription, and it counterfeits the inscription on the high priest mitre. The high priest mitre says, holiness to the Lord. Here, she's Mother Babylon, the mother of harlots. So what you have here in this woman is a counterfeit system to God's genuine truth. Now, we certainly don't uh, go down to the temple today. There's no high priest down there or priest. Uh, there's no, no blood sacrifices that need to be made. All of that pointed forward to the coming of Jesus and his great once for all sacrifice for mankind. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, where did Jesus go? He went to heaven. And the Bible says he went not just to heaven, but to the sanctuary in heaven where he stands as our high priest today, right? And so this great counterfeit system is looking to detract the attention of earth's inhabitants away from what Jesus is doing in the heaven sanctuary today by having its own earthly priests today, conduct, conducting the mass today, pronouncing the words horpus corpus meum and the bread and the blood or the wine turns literally into the, the body and blood of Jesus. That's what's believed. These are all counterfeits to the genuine uh, and the true the uh, communion service, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, his high priestly ministry in heaven. Not looking at things here on the earth, but looking into the heavens where Jesus is ministering for us. Now, she has a cup in her hand, has a golden vessel, 
And this kind of reminds us, if we go back to Daniel chapter five, remember Belshazzar had taken all those golden vessels out of uh, the, when, they, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Jerusalem, they took all the vessels out of the temple and they brought them to Babylon and they used those vessels in that drunken feast in Daniel 5, which preceded the fall of Babylon that night. Uh, they used that to have their drunken debauchery. They drank out of these golden sacred vessels, vessels dedicated to the service of God. And it looks good on the outside, but inside is, is something deadly. It's the falsehoods of Satan's end time religious system, the teachings of Satan's end time religious system. And what are the teachings of Babylon? Well, if you go back to ancient Babylon, Babylon had two predominant teachings. One, they worshiped the sun. And secondly, they believed in the immortality of the soul, that the soul would just live on, preceded the body, continue to live on, live on past the body, which has created all types of crazy teachings and all types also of, of, um, of, uh, of strange practices in, uh, in, in pagan societies. And so the, the main teachings of Babylon really revolve around Sunday, Sunday sacredness. They revolve around the immortality of the soul, that, that death is not really sleep. It also revolves around a false gospel, a gospel that says you're saved by your works, not saved by grace through faith. That works, you see. So this is a, a big counterfeit system to seduce the world away from God. And... Uh, so in a, in a day and age, and, and you know, we do live in a day and age where uh, there's calls for unity among Christ, in, in Christianity in particular. Uh, the, uh, the leader of that movement is the leader of uh, the Vatican City Church. And uh, it's a big call for unity. Uh, this, we call that ecumenism. This call for coming together of all the church. Doesn't matter what, you, let's put our differences aside. Let's agree on one thing and that is uh, maybe changing society, making sure that uh, social issues are, are, are taken care of. Let's put our, diff our theological differences aside and let's come together. But I wonder, in this day of uh, an age of ecumenism, uh, whether we ought not, it would ought not be a good idea for us to remember the past. Uh, and also to remember that prophecy predicts a day where church and state will again one day unite. We need to be very careful of calls to, to, uh, to come together, especially those calls that say, let's put away our theological differences. There can only be true unity when there is genuine love that comes through the, the indwelling of the power of the Holy Spirit, Romans 5.5, 5, and then also truth. Jesus said, sanctify them by their truth. And, he, and this is the unifying factor. You cannot, you cannot be truly sanctified by error. You cannot be sanctified by error. You can only be sanctified by truth. And when God's people stand on the platform of truth, that truth has a sanctifying effect, changes their life, their outlook, their attitude, etc. then they come together in, 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 in greater unity. And so you can't, you can't put uh, differences aside. Um, you can't put clear doctrinal biblical teachings aside for the sake of unity. So let's be careful about those calls today. What do you say out there? Sure. All right, let's, uh, we're going to go to Tuesdays and Wednesdays lesson. What I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these two days together, if that's okay with you. We're going to combine these two days together. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 17, and we're going to read verses 7 through 12 now. And we're moving into the area of, of uh, uh, where John is, being, is given the interpretation of this vision that, uh, that, uh, that he's seeing. So let's go to verse 7, and we'll read verse, down to verse 12, Revelation 17. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? Because in verse 6, John sees these things and he marvels greatly. And you can understand, I'd be marveling too if I was seeing this, this great apostate power and what, he was, what she was able to do to God's saints, his people, and his truth. The angel said, why are, you, why are you marveling? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and the ten horns. The beast which you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. So here is a beast that was, is not, and yet is. Have you got that? Okay. Now it's going to get more interesting. Verse 10, verse 9 rather. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Well, these are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. 
The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And verse 13 says, these have one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. All right, so how do we understand all of this? Whew. Now, there are many interpretations that have been offered over the years, just briefly. One interpretation of the seven heads, for example, starts with a list of the Roman emperors uh, as the heads of the Roman state, like Augustus and Tiberius and Claudius and Nero, etc. Uh, this interpretation assumes that the beast is referring to which power? Pagan Rome. That's the, that's the assumption. So the seven heads represent the, the heads of the, of the state of Rome. Um, then you have uh, aligned with this presupposition is another interpretation that cites a string of successive Roman administrative styles because the, the Roman, Rome's, Rome had different administrative styles. It, had a, it was a republic and then it had a consular and different others. Then there's another uh, interpretation offers a succession of seven end time popes as heads of the Roman church. That interpretation assumes that the, 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 the scarlet beast is in fact the papacy. Now, if we go to Jeremiah 51, you can just write these down. Jeremiah 51, 24 and 25. Daniel 2 verses 44 and 45. They show in Bible prophecy that a mountain represents a kingdom or a nation. And, you know, and we have to keep in mind, prophecy generally deals with, uh, doesn't deal with individuals. It deals with entities. Um, and so the, the Bible prophecy represents, uh, mountain represents a kingdom or a nation. So with this in mind, one of the simplest of the many interpretations, and it's not the one that I'm espousing, but one of the simplest of the many interpretations is to look at the, these verses and these seven heads as seven per consecutive persecuting powers viewed from the time that John wrote the Revelation. So from where he stands going back. So with that in mind, that, this interpretation would consider the five heads that have fallen to be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and then Greece. That's what it would say. And then the head that is currently is the Roman Empire, which was ruling, of course, in John's day. So that kind of makes sense. And then the head that is not yet come, the seventh, is the Roman church when uh, pagan Rome transitioned and became papal Rome. And they, can, they add uh, Egypt and Assyria because they, in, in the Old Testament, have, have and were enemies of God's people. So they, they throw them in there. Now, there's also another fairly uh, simple interpretation that instead views these verses from the end time perspective. And uh, so, in other words, the five that have fallen would be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then Papal Rome when it received its deadly wound. Uh, the sixth head is, it, that is, is Papal Rome that is, has received its deadly wound. And then the seventh that will is not yet come is Papal Rome revived. All the world wandered after the beast. Do you remember? The deadly wound is healed and so on. All the world wandered after the beast. And then this view also sees the hour, that hour in which the ten kings or the ten horns, they reign with that beast power for a very brief period of time at the very end. And they, with uh, dictatorial intensity, they aid in, in reviving the beast power and giving strength and aid to the beast power. So that's another view. We have to ask three questions to understand this little puzzle, I think, um, because there's a lot of confusion about it. And I'm going to just share what I understand. And there may be more to it, but I'm going to just give it my best here this morning. Uh, there are three questions. First question we should probably ask is, what time frame are we to look at these verses through? In the day that John is writing it down or in the day that he is seeing the vision where he's caught to? That is where he's taken to. That's the question. Uh, that's number one. Number two, should we use any other persecuting powers that have not previously been referenced in Daniel and Revelation? So should we be using Egypt, Egypt and Assyria? Because they're not even talked about in Daniel and Revelation. Number three, is the language that is used here to be taken as it stands or in a kind of an accommodating sense? All right, so those are the three questions. Let's explore them. First of all, the time frame. Now, if you go to Revelation 21, verse 9 and 10, you'll notice there 
that John, an angel, invites John to watch the new Jerusalem come down from God out of heaven. Just bear with me. This is an example, all right? So an angel invites John to watch the new Jerusalem come down from heaven. The invitation to John carries John's mind forward to what time? When the new Jerusalem comes down. That would be when? After the 1,000 years mentioned about in Revelation chapter 20. So his mind is taken all the way into the future, right? So similarly, at the beginning of Revelation chapter 17, and we go back to Revelation 17, what does an angel do? The angel invites John to come and see what? The judgment of the, the woman. So he's carried in vision where? Forward to the time of the judgment. All right, okay. So the invitation took John's mind forward to that time. So here's the question. Shouldn't then Revelation chapter 17 be interpreted from the viewpoint of the judgment? Shouldn't it be seen from that period? 1798, 1844 and forward, the time of the end, forward. Because that's because his mind has been brought forward to the time of the judgment of the woman. So shouldn't we be seeing it through that time? This is the time frame that a judgment scene happened in Daniel chapter 7, the opening of the little book in Revelation chapter 10, and then the preaching of the first angel's message in Revelation chapter 14, which reminds us that the hour of his judgment is come. The hour of his judgment is come. So if we think about it this way, the last half of the book of Revelation where we're finding ourselves today studying this, this, these chapters concerns itself with what events, past events or future? Future, that's right. In the first part of Revelation, you have days of John all the way till the end of time, but it primarily concerns itself with past from our standpoint, the time of the end. The past deals a little bit with the future. In the last part of Revelation, you have it primarily concerned with the future, a little bit of past, but primarily the future. And so it makes good sense to view Revelation 17 through the eyes of John where he is taken in vision to the judgment. Okay, keep that in mind. Second question, should we introduce other persecuting powers that haven't been mentioned? The answer probably is no. Daniel and Revelation do not mention uh, necessarily Egypt and Assyria. Uh, the prophecies uh, of Daniel give, our, give a, key, a key to helping us understand Revelation. And the powers that Daniel has to deal with primarily are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then Papal Rome. Okay, those are the, those are the powers. Now, Let's just talk, let's just wander down this lane just a little bit. The scarlet beast in Revelation 17 is the same beast in Revelation 13. Let me explain. Both are standing in the water. Both have seven heads and ten horns. Both have the name of blasphemy written in their foreheads. Both are a persecuting power. Okay? The, the similarities are, are right there. But when you look at Revelation, there seems to be four... Four beast power, four entities, four animal symbols. You have the dragon in Revelation 12. You've got the, the, the leopard-like beast in Revelation 13. You've got the lamb-like beast in Revelation 13. Then you've got the scarlet beast in Revelation 17. Seven heads, ten horns, right? Now, keep follow with me. The dragon and the beast, the dragon of Revelation 12 and the beast of Revelation 13, both have seven heads and ten horns. And they represent one and the same spirit of persecution, always persecuting. These are persecuting powers. This is what Revelation is concerned with. The seven heads, therefore, of these, of this, of these beasts call attention to sevenfold sequences of persecuting governments. We're dealing with a persecuting power, and so these heads represent a sevenfold sequence of persecuting, uh, persecuting government. So whereas the dragon calls attention to the persecution at the hand of ancient Rome, because ancient Rome persecuted God's people early on, the beast of Revelation 13 calls attention to the persecution of the Middle Ages at the hand of the papacy, right? And the middle, the lamb-like beast, the lamb-like beast, the second beast in Revelation 13, calls attention to the end time Protestantism as it finally lapses into a dragon-like, beast-like spirit of persecution. And then as for the two stages of the beast itself, you have the leopard-like beast that calls attention, of course, to the persecution of the Middle Ages. And then the scarlet-colored beast calls attention to two things. 
First, to its, its weakness at the beginning of the judgment message because it has not received power, has not yet received power. And then secondly, it, it phases into a dramatic but brief resurgence of the Middle Ages persecuting power that the church had back in the Middle Ages. And this happens prior to the second coming of Jesus. There's a lot there. I encourage you to get the DVD uh, when you're done or the CD. So that's the second. Should we use, persec should we use powers, persecuting powers that I mentioned? No. Third question has to do with language. Is it all inclusive or should we just read it as is? So the third guideline for interpreting the heads and the horns and the harlot and the beast uh, is, is, is in the language of Revelation 17. And we should see it as being used in an accommodating sense, in an accommodating sense. Let me see if I can help us understand that. For example, in verse 8 of Revelation 17, the beast is not yet. We read that, right? The beast is not yet. Even though while we're listening to the angel, and the angel tell us this, we're looking at the beast right through John's eyes. He's saying it's not yet, but we're looking at it. In a similar way, you have the 10 kings in verse 12. It says they have not received any kingdom yet. But in verses 1 and 2, they have already, as kings, they've gone to bed with the harlot. So they've already, they've already have an existence. They already have had a kingdom. So in Revelation 13, we see this, the beast, the, the, the 10 horns wearing a crown. Do you remember that? The horns had a crown and they had the crown during the 1260 years. In a little while, in Revelation 17, they're going to get authority as kings again, no doubt as intolerant states, and they're going to rule the, with the beast for one hour during which they make war with the lamb, and then, of course, they turn against the beast uh, because it's done, it, done its harm. So the beast is not, let me see if I can help us, the beast is not in comparison with what it used to be and in comparison with what it will be. It is not. In other words, it doesn't have the power that it used to have, but it will have power. But it is not currently, right now. Um, they say there's something like, have you heard of John Paul Jones? John Paul Jones, he was the skipper of the Bonhomme Richard. As most American school kids know, when Jones was already embroiled in with the British frigate uh, Serapis or Serapis, he shouted these words, I have not yet begun to fight. Now, did he mean that he hadn't started fighting? Or did he mean that he hadn't yet really begun to fight? <laughs> right. He was already embroiled and engaged with that frigate, that British frigate. But he said, I have not yet begun to fight. What he meant was, they haven't seen the best of me yet. They haven't seen the best of me yet. And that's what we're dealing with here in Revelation 17. The beast that is not, I haven't yet seen my full power yet because I'm going to be supported by these 10 kings. Now, what about the beast that is also the eighth, which is also the set of the seven? <laughs> Let's not make it too complicated. The beast isn't an eighth head. It's not an eighth head. It's a beast and the seven heads all belong to it. Now, when we add up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, what do you get? <laughs> you get an eighth number. Isn't that right? Sure. But this eighth number belongs to the seven. In other words, it's a sum or the substance of the others. So that's all it simply means. Let me explain it this way. When the leopard-like beast in Revelation 13 receives a deadly wound, what does it receive a deadly wound to? It's one of its what? Heads. Does that mean the body is now fine and it still functions? No, it affects the body. But when that deadly wound of one of its heads is healed, what happens to the whole beast? All the world will wonder after not the head, but after the beast. Do you understand now? Okay. So the, so the, 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 seven, the eighth, which is of the seven, just simply refers to the beast, the power itself, the actual beast itself. And during the beast's illness in lamb-like, a, a lamb-like rival appears on the scene, and it seems to be front and center, but it doesn't really become front and center because it ends up giving life and authority and, and strength and assists the beast power of Revelation 13. Now, let's apply all of these three questions or principles, okay, to what we've just read in Revelation 17. The seven heads, five are fallen. These entities are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Papal Rome. From the standpoint of where John is taken in vision to the judgment of the great harlot, 
He's looking back. Babylon has fallen. Medo Persia has fallen. Greece has fallen. Rome has fallen. Papal Rome has received a deadly wound. Fallen. By the time of the vision, Papal Rome is still suffering, of course, from this deadly wound. So now we're living in the time of the sixth head, where it hasn't gained full, full power yet. The seventh head, what does that mean or reference? The, the head that will be, that is not yet. That is referring to papacy revived. Under, this, under Babylon, this, this threefold union structure, this power, this entity. And, uh, and of course, then uh, it revives, being, being that it revives the entire beast, that is the eighth. It revives the beast. So that's what we're looking at. And that's, I think, probably one of the better ways to understand the prophecy of Revelation chapter 17 when it comes to the seven heads and the horns, the powers, and so on and so forth. You've got uh, this, this, this confederation, then you've got the Battle of Armageddon, and, uh, and of course it doesn't take place in the Middle East, it's that spiritual battle that, uh, that culminates in the return of Jesus. But before all of that takes place, before probation closes, there's a call to Babylon, and uh, Pat's going to read that to us. Thanks, Pat. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye may not be partakers of her sin, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities." Thank you, Pat. Who is still in Babylon according to these verses? God's people. God still has people in Babylon. And he is using his last day remnant people to call them out, lest they receive of the plagues. You can't reform Babylon. Babylon will not be reformed. Uh, reformers in the past have tried, and it will not work in the last days. So people have got to come out lest they receive of the plagues. The reason for this call is because God is not willing that any should perish, but that how many should come to repentance? All should come to repentance. So we need to be careful and take heed, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, lest we fall. Let's make sure Jesus has our hearts. And while we're calling people out, may they be attracted to that call because they see in us Jesus Christ. Is my prayer and is my hope. Uh, take courage today, friends. Trust you're encouraged by the study and some things were made a little clearer. If not, Make sure you get the DVD. Those tuning in, make sure you get the free offer because it's uh, this presentation on CD or DVD as well. It's off of C21912. Call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. We'll be happy to get that right out to you. And we look forward to seeing you next week when we uh, close our study in the book of Revelation and uh, we'll have our pastor's panel uh, for that discussion next week. God bless you.